Good afternoon, and thank you so much for coming to today's conversation with WSU alumnus Ted Tremper. It's such a pleasure to host Ted's virtual return to campus. As you know, he worked for two years with the author of this year's common reading book, Trevor Noah, on The Daily Show. And he also brings deep experience in the realm of social and political comedy. So we're so pleased that you could join us this afternoon. I'm Karen Weatherman, Director of First Year Programs at WSU. WSU's Common Reading Program is one of those that is in my area, and it's my delight and honor each year to be able to focus the tremendous resources of our campus and community on topics of importance. This year, our year-long conversation is centered on topics related to the book Born a Crime, and in partnership with an array of WSU units, we offer one or more events around these topics each week. In fact, one of the silver linings of our COVID lives is that because all our events this year are remote, we can share events across all six of our campuses. And I especially wanna welcome those of you who are joining us, well, from all our campuses actually, um, and that we can include speakers like Ted, who is not physically here in Pullman, but in Los Angeles, I believe today. Um, I encourage you to consult our, the upcoming events um, with our, on our calendar, on our, WS, our Common Reading website. And I wanna bring one especially to your attention. On November 12th at 6 p.m., um, the Office of Equity and Diversity is sponsoring a nationally acclaimed performance of the defamation um, experience. It starts with a 70 minute courtroom drama that explores uh, issues surrounding race, class, religion, gender, and the law. And then it has the twist that all of us who attend as audience members will serve as the jury. So I encourage you to think about attending that event. Um, you have to register by November 9th. And if you go to our common reading calendar, you can do that. You can see the common reading calendar for the links to our events as well um, as to see the full array of upcoming events. And if you are attending for course credit at the end of today's event, we'll be dropping into the chat a link you can use uh, to can verify your attendance. I also wanna let you know we're accepting nominations for next year's common reading book at our website as well. So now to get to our invited speakers. Along with Ted Tremper, I'm being joined today by Buddy Levy, a longtime faculty member in the Department of English. In addition to teaching creative writing, screenwriting, and technical, technical and professional writing, Buddy is himself a freelance journalist and the author of eight nonfiction books on topics of adventure, history, and the outdoors. He was also a cast member for two seasons on the History Channel show Decoded. For today's purposes, however, the important thing about Buddy is that he was Ted's teacher and mentor in the creative writing program while Ted was a student at WSU. They've maintained their connection and friendship as Ted's career has taken him to Chicago's Second City, The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, and more. Buddy is going to start off our conversation with a brief intro of Ted and then lead into our first questions. Thanks to those of you who submitted questions ahead of time. We also welcome your questions that occur to you during this event and invite you to post them to the chat and we'll get to those toward the end of our time together. Hey, Karen, and uh, thanks so much for the introduction. And um, I wanted to thank you also for all the great work you do with the Common Reading Program. Um, I also wanna thank everyone out there in Zoom and YouTube land for joining us. And of course, uh, I want to thank Ted Tremper just for being Ted Tremper. Um, I wanted to give just a brief introduction about him. I uh, met Ted back in the early 2000s in a classroom in Thompson Hall on the WSU Pullman campus. And he took a few writing courses from me. Um, I was immediately struck by Ted's humor, his intellect, his dynamic personality. Uh, and it became clear very early on that not only could he be teaching the class, but that he was going to go places. Um, Ted's resume and accolades are impressive, of course. Uh, he's an award-winning filmmaker, a writer, producer, and improviser. And two of the projects that he worked on um, impressed me really deeply, and I got to see them fairly early on. And both of them he wrote and directed. They were called Breakups and Shrink Series. Um, they're hilarious and tragic at the same time, which I think much great comedy is. And you can find 
these and much other of Ted's work at tedtremper.com. I encourage you to, to check it out. Um, but the two gigs that he had that have most impressed me, I suppose, were these. Uh, dying, um, which I'm sure makes for great storytelling and, and characters. Uh, and he also performed improv comedy on a cruise ship while sailing through the Panama Canal. And maybe he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the pretty interesting character building jobs. Um, just a quick anecdote about Ted that I think says a little about who the kind of guy he is and how much uh, he puts into his work. Um, one time he showed up in my classroom and he had a, an aggressive mullet. I mean, it was serious. And um, I asked him about it and he said that he was in a play at the time and to really get into the character, he, he wanted to not just wear a wig, but just to go full mullet. And after class, he invited me to uh, walk around campus with him and see the kind of reactions. I'm, apparently mullets weren't really uh, de rigueur at the time, but we cruised around campus and um, kind of did a sociological experiment on the, on the way uh, people responded to him and it was very amusing. Uh, some people were just perplexed and others were sort of um, bemused and others were kind of aggressive about it. And I think that sort of immersion speaks a lot to the kind of uh, work that Ted has um, gone on to do with uh, Sarah Silverman and Trevor Noah and of course the uh, uh, Borat, um, new, new Borat movie. Um, so Thanks for being here, Ted. And just to uh, get rolling, I wanted to ask you um, if you talk a little bit maybe about how your experiences at WSU informed your early career and um, sent you on your career tra trajectory. What perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. That was really, that, I think that ended up going. I, for, before, I, I, I don't want to forget, what was the first job that you mentioned? Because it blanked out for a second. Shoeshine. Oh yeah, oh yeah. That was my I, my first job uh, ever was shining shoes at the Nordstrom's uh, uh, in Bellevue, Nordstrom store number four, which was still to this day probably the I wouldn't say it's the best job I've ever had, but it's the best job for a young person to have because you make uh, five dollars every five minutes when you're working, and when you're not, you're sitting on two leather sofas watching uh, two different TVs. Um, uh, and I also want to mention so the the thing about the mullet. My mom died while I was at WSU and uh, I had had long hair because of a play. And I realized that I wasn't gonna be in a, a place to, to date or to really be sociable uh, for a while. So I cut that mullet for this play, but also uh, I referred to it as the great mullet that liberates upon seeing because I, <laughs> Buddy is referencing basically every person that saw it would either get really happy or really angry. Uh, and it was, it was great. It was, it was, <laughs> I don't have, I don't have a picture of it, but I wish, I, I wish I had. Um, yeah. So the, the, your question buddy about, uh, I guess it's, it's experiences at WSU that kind of got ready for doing other stuff is kind of the deal. A lot of the questions I think we got in advance are about kind of how to get a job at the daily show or whatever. And, and the kind of, the odd question is, I don't know, because uh, things have obviously changed quite a bit since I was around. But from WSU, I uh, was dating somebody at WSU that I loved very much. And so <clears throat> we she was an entomology major. I was an English major. And so we both uh, knew we were probably going to go back to grad school. So we decided to teach English in Japan for a year. And then she was accepted to Yale while we were there. So then I lived in New Haven. And then I was accepted to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago uh, for an MFA in writing. So I moved to Chicago and I had chosen that school pretty much only because I wanted to study improv, but um, I had taught playwriting as an undergraduate at WSU and I knew that I loved uh, um, teaching at, at a college level. So I figured if I got an MFA early, I could go and try to do a bunch of cool things. And then um, when a global pandemic would hit in, in 2020, th then I'd be able to, to go back to teaching. Um, and so, yeah, so in Chicago, I. <clears throat> started doing improv at uh, the Improv Olympic, uh, which was then called IO, which now I think no longer exists because of the pandemic. And then I also uh, performed at the Annoyance Theater and the Second City, which also, uh, the Annoyance is doing well. The Second City, <clears throat> is you can Google what's been going on with them. 
Uh, but I think they are also uh, having a hard time. But uh, yeah, so I did, I was on 11 different improv teams at the same time for about seven years. Uh, shout out to, to Joey Romain and uh, all everybody on my teams uh, that are watching this now. Um, and I started making short films because basically improv is, is the greatest it's the greatest joy that I think I've ever had, but it's also a very difficult thing to transmute into anything else that you can really, you know, show someone and say, hey, hire me to do X, Y, Z. So um, in 2000, I think uh, eight or nine, I started making web series. And really the goal was just, how do I make someone who, who doesn't care about improv feel the way I do about these performers that I knew and loved? And so I started directing uh, basically my like improv heroes. And that uh, led to me making in Chicago, I made something like 31 short films and then a TV pilot. Um, and the total production cost for all of that was I think $211 um, because everybody was just, everybody wanted to work all the time. So I had spent my life savings at that point buying uh, a Canon 5D Mark II and two lenses and two wireless microphones. Um, and that was about $11,000. Um, and then I had sought out work at uh, two different nonfiction production companies because I knew that if I was nice to the production manager, they would probably let me borrow equipment, which they did. So basically for the entire time I was in Chicago, I was working 40 hours a week uh, in production and then about 40 hours a week doing improv. And that basically just, that was seven and a half years straight of doing that um, and making things. And then eventually um, Shrink, which is the show that Buddy mentioned, won the New York Television Festival as a pilot. And that got me agents and then the agents, you go on these things called general meetings. Um, so I went on a general meeting at The Daily Show in 2000, like it was like 2013 or something. And uh, by that time I had a bunch of like hard news documentary stuff on my reel, but then I also had a bunch of comedy stuff. And my, the guy who would later become my boss, Tim Greenberg basically said, well, we would hire you right now, but we just hired a guy uh, uh, that we don't really like that much. So kind of hang in there uh, and just keep watching the show and maybe we'll figure out a way to get you on board. And it wasn't until three years later that uh, John left the show and or I guess it was two years later um, John left the show and a bunch of field producers went off to go work with John Oliver or work with Sam B, uh, which left enough vacancies for me to reapply. And then I, that's how I got the job there. So I, I basically, in answer to all the questions of how do you get a job at the daily show, it's basically, you know, work very, very hard on things on your own things with the people that you love with no expectation of doing those things. It's a, it's a kind of, I think Thomas Jefferson's quote that luck is what happens when opportunity meets preparation. It's essentially focus on, focus on who you love, what you love doing and what you love making. And then one way or another things will work out, I think. So it sounds like um, you're talking about constantly creating content yeah. um, so that when an opportunity does arise and you um, maybe have a meeting, uh, creating content and also um, nurturing incredible um, people who you want to work with. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, in terms of, I've come back to WSU, I think two other times to teach and the, the really big things, I always think about what I wish I had known. And I think the biggest things that I wish I had known were to focus on process and not product, meaning that you should be developing habits that are solely focused on bringing sort of joy and energy and curiosity into your daily life and what you're making. So developing a habit of writing rather than saying, I'm gonna write this one thing or developing a habit of rehearsing and performing improv and developing the relationships that will make you love doing that. There's a saying, there's a saying in improv why, so Chicago improv, New York improv and LA improv and they're, they're different in different ways. Um, there's a saying of Chicago improvisers that in Chicago you do improv hoping you can do it for the rest of your life. And in LA you do improv hoping you never have to do it again. <laughs> and a lot of that is because like people, Dave Pasquese is one of, I think the, the two greatest improvisers that ever lived. He said that that's a, that's a, a justifiable 
thing in LA because someone can be in the audience who can take you away and give you all the toys is the way he phrased it. (laughs) And I think if you think that way, it it really is a thing where if that, if your end goal is to use what you're doing to do something else, there's absolutely no guarantee that that something else will ever happen. So the more important question to ask yourself is what do you enjoy doing? Um, and and I, I should I should make a clear point that I don't mean what's easy to do and uh, you know sort of what it, nothing nothing is easy. I mean and none of it is easy. Being a farmer isn't easy. Becoming a doctor isn't easy. And becoming a screenwriter or a comedian isn't easy. It really requires an amount of dedication that's born out of your passion and your curiosity to do the thing. Uh, or what's lucky in, in comedy is that typically you're able to surround yourself with people who are so much funnier than you are that it becomes a sort of redoubling experience all the time. And sort of improv hubs like like what Chicago was and what New York was and what LA was, really the benefit and the thing that I wish I had known when I was starting out was really the only thing that's important about that time is failing as often as possible and developing the relationships with the people that you're gonna keep your whole life. I think Amy Poehler, in Amy Poehler's book, she says, uh, it's basically do improv, it's just like do improv, be nice. And in, in nine years, someone will give, or one of your friends will give you a job or something like that. <laughs> so you um, need to be a little patient too. Yeah, um, and I, well, but buddy, you and I were talking earlier today and I remember being at WSU and, and like asking you in class, how you get an agent and things like that. When I had never really, I think completed a story that I think was worth publishing. And I think a lot of that is the it's 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 very odd. I think about the same thing with stand up and with um, with authors or whatever. I think if you pulled a regular person out of a mall in in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and asked them how many stand up comedians they can name, they maybe could name five, or how many authors they could name, they maybe could name ten. And there are tens of thousands of people who are doing that both of those things all the time. So. I think each one of them probably started with aspirations of becoming one of those five or 10 names. The important thing to remember is if you're not enjoying that, then your life is going to be a living hell, regardless of what level you matriculate to. Because on these shows, there are people who are satisfied with what they are doing. And there are people who are very wealthy or very successful who are working on the shows who think they're complete failures because they didn't do the thing that they wanted to do. Right. Um, a quick question about um, some of your recent work. I mean, obviously, we're in a moment right now, and you have worked in sociopolitical comedy uh, with The Daily Show, with Sailor, with uh, Sarah Silverman, mm-hmm. and of course, I love saying Borat subsequent movie film. Um, yeah. But you said something in a recent article um, here in the, the Lewiston Trib that struck me and I wanted to uh, get your sort of take on it and maybe a little elaboration. And here's what you said. Um, I felt that this is after after Trump was elected. I felt a lot of fear that the way Trump supporters had been satirizing. um, I felt a lot of fear that the way Trump supporters had been satirized only served to create more polarity. The biggest fear that I have, not only for this election, but for our country in general, with social media polarizing us more and more is that at a certain point we'll tear each other apart at the edges. And I'm, I'm assuming that you mean that uh, metaphorically and not sort of um, guns and pitchforks, but that's happening too. Uh, I mean, both. Yeah, I absolutely <laughs> mean both. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it, it's, we've entered this really interesting period where we, I mean, I, I, I just my family history, my dad uh, uh, had been a Republican his whole life and my mom had been a Democrat her whole life and it just wasn't a big deal. Um, and so things like, you know, politics and discourse, they were they were discussed with as much passion as a, you know, as, as like differing sports teams, you know, and, and I think that 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 can be the case for a lot of people. But then again, if you get into a Yankees Red Sox situation, like there are people who are willing to beat the hell out of each other because of those differences. And obviously I come from a, a sort of extraordinarily privileged background, both, both racially, but sort of was raised middle class. And then uh, it's a long, insane story, but uh, it, it's basically 
shortly before my mom died, my dad, uh, basically he and four friends, they worked at a construction company uh, that uh, built the Space Needle and a bunch of other skyscrapers and stuff. And they'd worked there for a combined total, I think of 120 years, like each of them had worked there for 30 years. And then they were bought by, a, uh, the, the company was sold to a multinational conglomerate. And then they were going to sell it off for pieces, but basically they leveraged their each of their collective life savings to, to buy it back from them. And then they ran it and did really well at that. Um, and it's also just being a, a, a sort of mostly straight white dude, uh, the stakes of this election or really any election are not as high for, for me as they are for other people. So sort of prefacing all of that in terms of, I think that it's basically there, I feel like, there's an absolute value uh, of, of energy on either side. You can sort of take people who um, have a lot of passion and that can be leveraged into really interesting discourse and sort of spirited disagreements where people actually find mutual ground. But then there's sort of the negative side uh, of that number line, if you will, that only seeks to kind of destroy. Um, and the thing that becomes terrifying to me is that it seems like the politicians who are in control, certainly on the right, it, it's, I've, it's, I'm not really a, a conspiracy theory minded person, but every once in a while, I think about those studies that uh, ExxonMobil did in the seventies, basically knowing that global warming exists. I just think about in the eighties, essentially white Republicans, uh, no offense to uh, white Republicans, but the white Republican hierarchy essentially realizing we've got about 40 years left at best. So we may as well get while the getting's good. Cause I really can't think of an, I, I can't think of a way that the things they're making specifically with the Supreme court confirmation yesterday, it really just sort of, they're acting the way that I would act, uh, you know, if I was trying to, to rob a mall before a zombie apocalypse took over. And so to me, the thing that scares me is it doesn't really seem like, you know, Democrats, I feel like sort of get stereotyped as being kind of spineless when it comes to making power moves and things like that. And I, I certainly think that's valid, but, but what I'm hoping with this election is that if Joe Biden wins, which I, I don't think at all is a certainty, um, his kind of message uh, of being, you know, Uncle Joe who can bring the country back together will hopefully push the factions that are far enough a right that the Republicans themselves are embarrassed by them, kind of push them off really back into the fringes. And then you'll just end up having a bunch of people who only want to take all of the money and uh, sock it away. And then you'll have other people who, you know, want to take some of that money and give it to people who need it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm yeah. wondering, I'm wondering where, where comedy fits into oh, this. Yeah. Yeah, you because talk about politics, um, it, you know, can it, is it possible for for socio political comedy to not be polarizing? Well, so it's interesting. I think so. At the, when I was at the Daily Show, this there was a an, he was an editor at the time, but it was so brilliant they've made him the head of the whole field department. There's a guy named Eric Davies, uh, and I had just come back from a piece uh, in like 2015, and Trump had just announced that he was running for president, and he turned around in his chair and he said, he's, he basically said, do you ever, do you, do you ever notice that people don't feel shame anymore when they're, when they're wrong? And I said, what do you mean? And he'd worked there for years and he explained that it used to be that like, if you caught somebody in a lie or you caught somebody with bad information, they would sort of get flummoxed and be embarrassed because they had been proven wrong. But what he was describing was the beginning of sort of the delegitimization of, of journalists and, and fake news. And so now, the problem with doing comedy uh, sort of in the current, uh, you know, I don't want it, it's, to, it's odd. I, I, I'm tempted to call it pseudo fascist, but I also don't want to alienate people. What, what I mean is the current administration obviously has done, has put a lot of effort into delegitimizing all media, including think, places like Fox News uh, when they release their own polls, et cetera, et cetera. So, what's happened is you basically have somebody who's enabled people to choose what they want their reality to be. So what becomes difficult is comedy at that point gets politically stratified to a point where there is no more discourse anymore. It's just one side making fun of the other. And I think I was, 
we didn't have TV growing up because I lived out in North Bend, Washington, and my dad lied to me and told me that uh, the cable didn't reach as far as we were, <laughs> and that this, and the trees were too tall for satellite. So uh, my mom was a teacher at Woodridge Elementary in Bellevue, and she they had they had Comedy Central. So I, every day after school, I would take my bus to her school and then record on a VHS cassette tape for six hours and watch The Daily Show every night as like a 12 year old. Um, and it inspired me so much later on when, you know, Republicans would come on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart and they would have, and there was a time where John McCain was the, the most frequent guest on The Daily Show. And this is before he ran for president the second time. But seeing that and understanding that essentially we are really at our best. At WSU, I learned about the notion of Mill's marketplace of ideas, where if everybody is contributing sort of their thoughts and ideas, then the marketplace can kind of choose what works and what doesn't work out of there. But what we've devolved into is a situation where I don't think that really any ideas are being conveyed anymore. What we have is just sort of name calling, blame shifting, vitriol and, and emotion. So I think it still is very easy and perhaps easier to be a hack political commentator because all you have to do is make somebody um, on the other side look stupid. But I think what becomes much more interesting is what Sarah Silverman tried to do, which her show, I Love You America, which I, I was a field director on was all of it was about how can we bring people back together and laugh together. So like we went to one of the pieces that is my favorite, we went to Mineola, Texas, which, which had been the I believe it was the precinct with the greatest number of Trump voters. Um, and we went there and the whole piece was the first minute and a half was us trying to find, you know, she interviewed 20 different people and it was us trying to find some kind of political common ground and we couldn't find that. And then at the end of that, she just asks, well, have you ever shit your pants? And every single person without a doubt, and this was totally based off of Sarah just had this inclination that everybody on earth has a really great story about either shitting their pants or almost shitting their pants. And it bared completely bare truth. And it was to have like people who had said really horrible things, uh, sort of from a, from a, uh, I mean, from any kind of perspective you would imagine, then completely open up because they had this shared experience of shitting their pants, uh, was one of the most, it, it's it's sort of this transcendent thing where you realize almost every single person at the end of the day, specifically Americans, are, are they're very open people. Uh, if you can kind of side door your way into something where you're, you're pointing out that you have more in common than you do uh, um, sort of rather than what divides us, you know. Um, right. So it's yeah. a very long-winded answer. No, it's great. But I think the short answer is, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's easy to be bad at it, um, but it's tough to be nuanced. And even so, in, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering, because I know um, everybody wants to know a bit about it. Um, you know, what did you learn um, from Trevor Noah, from working with him, not only the sort of on the ground field producer stuff, yeah. but um, about how about comedy and about social commentary yeah i think so the thing about trevor that's just transcendent i mentioned it in that article as well that he's essentially exactly uh, like on screen or off screen he's the exact same person and he's just infinitely curious uh and uh, not, not as a person he has he has infinite curiosity um and that really is the thing that is transcendent is basically you know, him being a citizen of the world and sort of being able to look at America objectively is really fascinating because he'll be able to point things out. I remember one of the first pieces that we had that went viral was pointing out that Trump, uh, essentially that Trump was America's first African president. And he pointed out all of these different things that these African dictators had said that in some cases were sort of verbatim uh, uh, plays out of uh, uh, Trump's playbook. And it's been this really interesting experience with him in the first, you know, running up to the election. He was the first person that I ever met that said he thought not only that Trump had a chance, but first, he was the first person that said, I think Trump will get the nomination. And he did. And then, you know, that, that he would have a chance because he had seen these kinds of people, this kind of strong men tactics net out with people who feel disenfranchised. And so he, before, you know, when he, after he left South Africa, he came here and he was like 
he went all over the United States touring uh, and, you know, went to, you know, Nampa, Idaho and, uh, you know, and, and all kinds of different places that are, you know, that, that stand up comics go to and you really get a chance to meet lots and lots and lots of Americans. And I think that he was able to ascertain that, you know, generally, it's, 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 it's interesting to say, like, I, I think a lot about the kind of Occupy Wall Street movement sometimes when I think about the media, where here was a situation where you had a massive grassroots amount, a, 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 a sort of swell of people who were protesting against a very specific thing. And then when the media went to cover it, it's all just a guy jumping around in a Spider-Man suit uh, or like whoever the weirdest person is, because that's the easy way to cover the story. And that's the way that you can kind of, I mean, there's, there, there, people tend to see really nefarious tactics and things like that. You know, somebody from that movement will say, well, the media is trying to delegitimize what we're actually doing. Or sometimes if we, you know, if as The Daily Show, we would go and, and satirize a specific protest or whatever, um, you know, the, the perspective of The Daily Show and, and I think regardless of ideology has always been to elucidate hypocrisy um, because that really is, it, it, it's, it's just the worst, uh, you know, and I think that, <laughs> that I was trying to find a more elegant way to put it, but it, it, it's, uh, when I applied for the show, Jordan Klepper, who's a correspondent, he was a Chicago guy. And so I, I texted him and asked what advice he had. And he said, the advice that John had given him was find the story that makes you the most upset and uh, use that emotion to make it funny, basically. So it's a thing where, you know, regardless of what your perspective is, if you can find people or a subject, uh, in a, going, going back to the previous question, I'm kind of rambling a little bit, but um, one of the things that makes it very, very hard about being funny with people who are hypocrites is that we don't have really shame anymore. That Lindsey Graham can say, you know, in 2016, use my words against me. We should not uh, confirm a Supreme Court uh, appointee in the year of an election. And then he, I mean, that, that it's so, ins it's, it's insane. It's like, it's, it, it doesn't, it truly doesn't matter because we've sort of been consumed by the notion of winning. Um, and that's, you know, when I start thinking about that, that's the stuff that actually kind of scares me is that you know, when you have people who are shameless, then there's no kind of soul there, I guess. Um, and and then you have sort of winning at all costs, and then you devolve into that sort of tearing tearing apart things at the at the seams, which um, right. yeah, spooky, scary stuff. Happy Halloween! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So I mean, just to touch on on this uh, notion of what you know, what Jordan Klepper does, um, and I think it's connected. I I'm wondering how if if you. Know, when you announce yourselves as, as working for The Daily Show, or um, how do people not see you coming and not understand well, that we're about, you know, that they want to be on TV so much that they don't care how they come across? Yeah, well, so it's interesting. I, I remember um, finding out that I think that by, by the time I was there, there was a guy um, who I don't even want to say his name because he's a real piece of, he's a bad guy. Uh, and <laughs> he's a bad guy and uh, uh, backed out of an interview. And one of the things that my boss, like he was basically saying we were gonna take him out of context or whatever. And my boss pointed out that by that time, The Daily Show had been about, had done about 18,000 interviews. And that in the entirety of the, at that time, I think it was 17 years that The Daily Show had been on the air, exactly two people had uh, sued them or complained about how they, um, had been portrayed, um, and only one of those, <laughs> only one of those lawsuits were lost, which is a whole separate, uh, very funny story. But um, I find that in my case, there was a guy that we did a piece on uh, with um, Ronnie Chang, and I did a piece about a, a tri-faith mosque that was being opened in Omaha, Nebraska. So it was literally a, a, a Muslim cleric, a, a, a rabbi, and a priest walked into a bar and decided to create a church together, and they did. And there was this guy who basically was, uh, he was a, an immigrant from Egypt who had converted to Christianity and he was convinced that uh, this church was a conspiracy that the Muslim Brotherhood uh, had cooked up as a way to infiltrate the American heartland. And so we interviewed him 
Uh, and, you know, he was able to espouse these different things. And it was this very interesting thing because he was very, very anti-Muslim, but his wife and entire family were Muslim, uh, except for him. And, you know, we, we made fun of him, uh, his, his perspective on the show. And his only complaint was that it, the piece wasn't longer. Um, and and right. it's, it's typical that basically people who have these far out beliefs, if they see what they are saying on TV, then they will be happy because they know that somebody else, you know, that they're get that they're spreading their message. And and of course, the irony is that that there are other people who believe that exact same thing. Uh, and so, you know, it, it, it's a net positive for them as far as they're concerned. Awesome. But, yeah, um, I have one uh, question from the um, a pre uh, a question that's been sent in, and then I wanted to um, kick it over to Karen and and uh, also. Uh, audience members who I know have a, a number of questions. Um, yeah. And this one's related. It, uh, it wonders whether or not you think, or whether you're required to use uh, journalistic standards in comedy news. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think, I think, so the entirety of the time that The Daily Show has existed, as far as I know, they've only, have, uh, they've only ever had to issue one retraction, uh, which was under the John era. And I remember seeing that and he was so crestfallen uh, that they had made a mistake, uh, you could just tell it, 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 it he, he had this unimpeachable um, integrity. And there's a whole, I mean, there's a guy named Adam Chodakovsky who is sort of this encyclopedia of all knowledge who is more or less in charge. He's a lead researcher, he's a, the senior researcher or lead researcher. But a lot of it's like, if you're just making stuff up, it's not funny because there's no, uh, I think um, Sam B put it, the Sam B or John Oliver put, used this metaphor that essentially, unless you're building, unless you're building your satire on bricks, uh, you know, if it's sand, the whole thing just falls over. You have to be building it on the foundation of truth or else someone can just poke holes in it and say, oh, well, none of this is real. So it, in fact, I think it's actually, I think it's incredibly important. And I think the training that I had at, at WSU was really important in terms of understanding what those ethics are. Um, but moreover, for comedy, it's like, there, there is no purpose in taking shortcuts other than being lazy. It's the same thing with stand up. If you say something that's almost true, uh, or, you know, then it's almost funny. You know, right. if, you, if you wanna just make things up, then you should just be writing fiction because then you can, that you can use satire uh, in, in the case of fiction to make something really interesting. but it, the reason I like sort of Adam McKay, Adam McKay's movies, The Big Short and, and Dick are really fascinating because those stories are true. You know, it, it, we didn't make up that Dick Cheney shot a guy in the face and then the guy apologized to him. You know, <laughs> it, it has to be true or else you should just write fiction. And, and, and so to answer the question directly, I think it's important, one, but also it, it, it should be known that the lengths to which, I mean, looking at the stuff that John Oliver or Trevor or Sam B or, or any other uh, specifically news or political satire show, they have whole departments of people that fact check these things, not only so they don't get sued, but because it has to be true or else it's not funny. And are you still watching um, these shows currently? And, it's, <laughs> and what? And how often and, or how, uh, you know. Are it's, you? I, I took a big long break after I left Daily Show uh, of not watching it partially because so I, I, I it's a long story but I left because the show that I created with my buddy Tim uh, Shrink was greenlit to series so I left that show and then went to the writer's room and then I actually came back my last gig, gig, gig at the Daily Show was the RNC and DNC in 2016 so I did those gigs and uh, that was the last time that I worked for it and I took basically a year off because watching it just made me really sad because it, it, I love it so much. I still miss it every single day because it's the greatest institution, but also the greatest work environment I've ever been a part of. Every single person there only cares about the show, only cares about getting it right. Um, and there's this bottomless sort of passion and uh, energy about the, the place. It's just wonderful. Um, so I, it was at least a year since uh, I didn't watch it for at least a year and now I'll sort of watch it sparingly because it, again, it like, it does make my heart hurt. Um, but I watch, I think we watch every episode of Oliver just because I feel like, um, you know, he, he's, he sums things up, I think in a very funny way. And, and, uh, 
it's odd. I kind of, I, I will go on periods of very long, what I call news vacations, where essentially I have enough people who are incredibly well-informed friends politically and otherwise that uh, I find that in it's something out of Tim Ferriss's four hour work week book that I'd rather have an hour conversation with a brilliant friend about what's going on than to follow the news an hour a day for, for a month. So it's sort of, I, I, I tend to be a little bit more, <laughs> Um, I, I, I tend to, to put blinders on a little bit more probably than I should. Well, for our aspirational students out there, and it, what, what's the climate like currently? And couldn't you just um, give them a call and uh, get back into the mix? Well, so they that so Daily Show has what they call a, a strict no revolving door policy because they they've got, they have so many talented people that these people could literally get hired away to go do things left and right. So they set early on this principle that once you leave, you have to go, um, which is, you know, heartbreaking. <laughs> but I still, I still enjoy my life. I still am very happy with things. But it's always kind of, um, you know, a before sunset, before sunrise kind of thing with that that institution. Um, yeah, I, I though I do think it's important to uh, follow your um, your dreams, and you know, if you're going to go off and do a show that you co-created and um, are going to get to write and direct. Yeah, that's sort of what you had had worked all this time for anyway, right? Yeah, I think so. And I think a lot of it's sort of my odd career has been kind of defined by trying to do things that I've never done before. You know, so it started by trying to show that improv can be interesting in a short film. Then it was trying to show that improv can be interesting in a, in a pilot. And then it was try to uh, try to focus basically everything I've been doing in hard news. And then all of, you know, at Second City, I'd be writing political satire and things like that. Um, you know, and, and I and I should say to people who are interested in getting jobs at places like Daily Show, you should watch every single episode. You know, I think that, like I said, since I was 12 years old to the time that John left, I think it's a fair bet to say I probably only missed four episodes of The Daily Show. So we're talking about, you know, uh, 16 years of not missing a, a show. Um, you know, and a lot of that's useful for for learning how to write in the voice of the show. But also when it comes to something as specific as political satire, you know, places like Second City or UCB or other places that seek to kind of deconstruct the form, there's a lot of useful kind of tricks that you can that you can utilize. Um, some, I think, kind of can become detrimental where, you know, the episode of, I was thinking of the episode of South Park where they satirized Family Guy, where it literally was, they were making fun of them is that the way that Family Guy writes their shows is they just have sort of reference manatees that that poke a ball into a hole and that's where they decide to do their cutaways and it's you know i think i think the it's it's really important to be able to look at what shows are doing and understand that almost as sort of a musical form the way that you know blues has eight bars and it goes it has a one four five progression or whatever understanding that those different things those are just tools for storytelling so if you can understand how those things are working and be able to write within those constraints, then you're going to be more sort of employable. And, and, and you know, I think as a journeyman, uh, journey, journey person, writer or creator, it's both important to be able to generate work that is original and then that, that, that is inspirational and that breaks con, con, uh, sort of um, constraints as it is to then be able to write within those constraints. Awesome. Hey, man, it's always great catching up. Uh, I know that uh, our audience wants to have some questions, so I'm going to um, shut up now. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Ted, for yeah. um, your conversation. I feel with like the you. answers are not funny and are very, very <laughs> long and, and, and boring. So if I need to be shorter, let me know. So some of the questions from students um, are back to thinking about the process that you went through as a student and, and entering this field. And one of the questions um, is uh, from Quentin, who asks, when wanting to create great content, do you think it's more important to put out more content or only creating a few good pieces over a couple period, over a couple years time period? That's a fantastic question. Um, I think that the importance is to constantly be generating content, but only share the things that you are proud of uh, and to constantly be reassessing what that is. There's a thing that um, I, I, I didn't coin this and I don't remember where I got it, but there's a thing that's called the YouTube problem uh, in casting, which was there were a lot of times in, you know, when I'd be trying to get a friend of mine a job and I would say, oh, you really, you know, to a casting director or somebody, 
so-and-so is the funniest person in Chicago. Uh, and then I would send a link to a specific thing that they had done maybe, or maybe I wouldn't have time to do that. And then that casting director or, or person looking to hire them would Google them and then would click videos or go to their YouTube channel. And the, you know, the first 12 things that came up on their YouTube profile were just terrible because they were things that they had done very early on in their career um, that never go away. So I think as a performer, it's, it's hard because you, you know, as a performer, you should be taking pretty much any job you can get just to kind of get the reps in. But if you're a filmmaker or a writer, um, uh, one, I think focusing on habits is more important than either of those things. Focusing on the habit of creating things and getting into a place of constant generation is, is really important and enjoying that. Um, but it, but in, in reference to that specific question, I think you should be constantly um, generating things, but only sharing the things that actually deserve to be seen, I think. And as a follow-up question, um, one of our viewers asks um, where you posted your first pieces of work. Was it via websites or film festivals? And, and sort of allied with that, another question about what is your advice for creating connections? So um, I started, when I started, I posted all my stuff to Vimeo, which still exists, which was sort of at the time was a, was a higher quality and sort of more associated with filmmaking uh, video sharing site. I think it sort of still feels that way now. Um, but back in the day, like they actually, they were just sort of much better. I think that YouTube uh, has kind of superseded them in terms of, you know, the ways that you're able to um, upload things, et cetera. But at the time, there was a really tight community of Vimeo people. And oddly, so, so Breakups was the first web series. I made one the first ever Vimeo award for best original series. And I went to the awards uh, to present the next year. And most of the people that I met there not only became good friends and lifelong friends, but when I moved to LA, there are two filmmakers named the Daniels who made a movie uh, called Swiss Army Man that everybody should watch. Um, those two guys I met at the Vimeo Awards and I ended up moving two blocks away from one of them and two blocks away from the other one. So we sort of live in a row and all of their friends, because since they were the first people that anybody knew that moved to LA, asked them, hey, where we should, should we live? And, and they just said, oh, we'll move to Highland Park. So now basically every single person that I know in LA lives within a mile and a half radius of their houses and all of their friends have become my friends. And that's kind of, you know, for, from a filmmaking perspective, that's how I grew a community. Um, and I think uh, as far as a performance thing, really what it, the way it used to be, and hopefully um, if and when the pandemic ever sort of ends, uh, I think improv uh, is by far the best way to meet other people who are performers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those people are still literally, I mean, I had four of them over yesterday. I built a, during the pandemic, I, we have a, a backyard and I built a, 18 by uh, 12 foot deck and made like an outdoor movie theater thing. So um, I had three of or three or four of those people over yesterday who were still my Chicago improv friends. So I think a lot of it, it's the same way that you'd make friends if you joined an intramural softball team. Those are all people that are interested in softball. So you have to ask yourself, okay, where do people who are interested in comedy go? And the answer to that for me was Chicago specifically. There was a saying, you go to Chicago to get good, you go to New York or LA to get famous. Um, and I think for me, Chicago was essential because I had so many things that I needed to screw up um, and learn. So that way, when I actually did go to New York or LA, I would have had, you know, 20,000 of those mistakes uh, under my belt as opposed to making those 20,000 and the other 20,000 that I've probably made since then happen in places where they actually kind of counted, um, if that makes sense. No, that does make sense. And in fact, one of the questions that just came in sort of relates to that. What is your best advice for when you bomb on stage, when when you misread an audience or misread a situation doing comedy yeah. and it just falls flat? So honesty, I think, is the most important principle in comedy just generally. And and so I, I show ran a, uh, so show running is a job that's basically you're like the CEO of, every production is kind of like a mini corporation. And a showrunner is kind of the CEO. So you're, you're, you're doing every job and supervising everyone. And I was a showrunner for three seasons of a show called This Week at the Comedy Cellar, which was basically 
we basically had six days to make a half hour documentary about all the standup that was happening at the Comedy Cellar and sort of put it within the skeleton of that week's news. Uh, and so I saw, I saw those are the greatest, some of the greatest comics on earth. And I saw quite a few people bomb. And my advice specifically is don't turn on the audience because that never really works out. If it's a heckler or like one person, then you, that you can develop over the course of your careers different ways of dealing with that. But I would say two secrets. One of them, which is really wonderful. My friend Mary Kate studied uh, under a really famous French uh, clown. She like went to literal clown college in Europe. And she said that when you take the stage in any scene or if you're doing stand up, every person is feeling tense for you because they don't, they want you to do well or they want you to not do well. But regardless, there's a tension as to whether or not what you're going to do. And what the clowns do is they, there's always a moment where a clown notices the audience and then takes a deep breath. And what happens is that forces the audience to take a deep breath and then to settle in. And then they feel more relaxed and they're more ready to engage with whatever you're doing. So I'd say that's one thing. It also just silences a position of power generally. If you come in and you're sort of going wackadoo, that's sort of expected. So if you take the stage and you take a moment and then you say what you wanna say, that's a position, puts you in a position of power. And then the other thing is just being honest. If a joke bombs or if you say something terrible, if something doesn't work, then just talk about how that didn't go well. And then that will release the tension in the audience as well. Sort of laughter. I mean, everything, everything in life is, is entirely about contrast and tension, yeah. I think. Um, to turn us back to The Daily Show and your work with Trevor Noah just a bit, um, one of our attendees today asked if you would comment on the notion that The Daily Show has a liberal agenda. <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I think that it's weird. I mean, I, I, what I would point to is, you know, the time during the Clinton era and during the Obama era, um, you know, I think John, after uh, George W. Bush and, and sort of the birth, as Fox News sort of came to power, a lot of John's agenda at that time was just pointing out that, you know, pointing out that, that these are supposed to be news shows. You know, if you look back at John Stewart did a very infamous uh, appearance on Crossfire, like in, in I think in the late nineties. And um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's interesting. I don't think I could ever tell somebody who is conservative that they don't have a liberal agenda because I think from that perspective, their agenda is liberal because they're speaking at it from a conservative perspective. But I remember getting into, there was a, a guy at the RNC who essentially jumped in front of the camera when we were filming at the Republican National Convention and claimed we were fake news and da 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 and then threatened to, to assault me and Hassan Minaj. Uh, and I just talked to him for a while. And what I pointed out was like, I'm, I, I'm from the Mark Twain school of thought, which is the only thing that uh, artists and specifically comedians need to be doing is speaking truth to power and making fun of people. There's a George Orwell quote that I love, which is, I think every joke is a mini revolution. So when it comes to whether or not they have a liberal agenda, I would say from a conservative perspective, sure. But I would also say from a very liberal perspective, those people probably want that show to be farther to the left. So I think that I, I think the answer is entirely subjective. What I can say from the perspective of making it, usually they just look at what is happening and where the holes are, you know, in terms of what people said that they were going to do and what they're doing or who people claim to be and how what they're doing undermines the, the sort of claimed identity. So it's, I'm not trying to dodge that question. I think from the perspective of the person who would ask that, the answer is probably yes, from their perspective. From the show's perspective, I think they're just trying to find who is in power, what they're doing, and point out how uh, it, it contradicts who they pretend hmm. to be. Well, and that ties into maybe a final question. You know, since we're looking at Trevor Noah's book, this year is our common reading. And of course that leads up only to really his early adulthood. So he's mm -hmm. growing up in apartheid South Africa. And I wonder what insights you gathered from your time at The Daily Show about the, the process that he brings to his work on The Daily Show's show and, and what sense of responsibility uh, he brings as a conveyor of news 
for a large segment of the population for whom mm -hmm. that is their source of news. Well, it's, it's interesting because I think, I think you get this from the book as well. Like despite, it would be very easy for Born a Crime to be a very sad and sort of Angela Ashes style uh, deconstruction of growing up in apartheid. But it's not that way because Trevor's not that way. You know, um, he's a guy who, first he just wants the show to be funny. Like he really, he, he doesn't, you know, and John talked a lot about this as well. The reason John left the show is that it wasn't fun anymore. You know, and I think that the, the thing that Trevor is great and I think um, shares with the, the enthusiasm that he has for being funny and for uh, loving laughter and things like that. And that being a life perspective, like he is he is the embodiment of comedy being somebody's life's work and soul um, sort of uh, desires to kind of be funny. I mean, this is a guy who he was famous enough before he took The Daily Show all over the world that he essentially was semi-retired, that he was rich and famous enough that if he wanted to make a quarter of a million dollars or a million dollars, he could just call a manager and say, book a show in Dubai and then fly there and sell out an arena. Like he was a very, very, very rich and famous person. But as many uh, foreign comedians find, success abroad kind of, you know, America's still the biggest pond, you know? So I think that one thing that's really awe-inspiring about him is one doesn't get a sense that The Daily Show is, was an aspiration to him at all. It's mostly just how do I do comedy and be funny? And this is an opportunity to reach more people and not only reach more people, but empower other people within the show to be better, sort of get better and then go off and do their own things. You know, And it, it's a thing where I've, I've never had a boss that was proud of me for leaving a show or was was really even fine with me leaving in the way that he was because I think speak I, I can't really speak for him but he he has a spirit where you know in his book he talks about really the only thing in life to aspire to is to have no regrets so I think that from his perspective you know we're only haunted by the roads that we don't take so if you if you have an opportunity then you should go for it and I think he tells it, it's in the story in regards to him like it, it, having a middle middle school romance with a girl that he didn't ask out. And I think learning that lesson very early on was sort of essential for him. Uh, and I think that, you know, that advice, I think is the same advice that I would, would give anybody, mm -hmm. which is essentially find a way to live your life with no regrets. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't really re I remember the context of the original question, but I hope that that makes some kind of sense. Yes. With the one follow-up that, yeah. There's a different responsibility though in, in something that that has a news focus mm. than, than just straight stand-up. It's a little bit different yeah. than just being booked into arenas to do your stand-up yeah, yeah. um, gig, to have a show that also has this news com you know, sort of component. Yeah. yeah, I think to me, I, I can't speak for Trevor, but I, I honestly think that he looks at it as an instrument that, that he's able to play. In the same way that you know, John Stewart before he was a, a political satirist was was a stand-up who would do autobiographical material, and I think the thing that's wonderful about Trevor is that he's it, it really is I would say it's as succinct as that he's a multi instrumentalist. I I honestly don't know whether he loves I, I would I would surmise based on the material that he does in his specials that he actually probably enjoys doing autobiographical stand-up more or differently than he likes doing political satire. But initially, I believe that he turned John down for the role for the Daily Show job, but and, and John sort of convinced him to come and look at how the show is made. And it was in seeing the show and how the show is made that really made him want to do it. Because, as I said, you know, it's an environment of about 60 people who are all functioning at the height of their intelligence completely selflessly to put together, you know, a, a show four times a week and it's fun and it's, and it's, and people laugh like it's, it's really, they make it seem so effortless. Um, and a lot of that's because of the infrastructure that John put together, but also Trevor's find found different ways to innovate and do more things with sort of sketches and whatnot and, and the way he's utilizing the correspondence. But it's a thing where if I had to speak from his perspective, I would say it's a part of his psyche that he's able to look at society and deconstruct it from a political perspective as much as he is able to look at his life 
and use the same kind of filtration to write a funny book about his childhood as opposed to a tragic book about his childhood. I mean, it's not often that there are funny books where your mom gets shot by your stepdad, you know? And so I think that that is, that, that speaks to a perspective, um, you know, and it's also just, he, he, you know, he's a guy that you can have, he talks about this a little bit, like he's, he's, he's just a person you, you can, you could talk to for an hour about anything and who would want to talk to you for an hour about anything because of that kind of curiosity. Yeah. So I would say, I would say, I can't, I can't really speak to his sort of the weight that he bears in, in being some, being a broadcaster. What I can say though, is that I would say the comedic parts come from a place of joy, but then going back to the other question about journalistic integrity, you know, his hero, one of his big heroes is Ted Koppel because Ted Koppel came to South Africa to cover apartheid and they've since become friends. I watched them speak on a panel together and really a lot of it is just sort of so much of comedy and so much of all of that is truth is truth to power, but just sort of truth in general, mm -hmm. you know, you, you, you really can't be funny if, if you're not resonating with other people and the truth yeah. always resonates, I think. Well, thank you, Ted, so much for spending an hour with us here at yeah. WSU. And to students who are watching, I really want to encourage you to think about Ted as an example of somebody who delved into the possibilities that WSU offers. I, I believe from one of the comments you wrote at the Evergreen, I know you did nuthouse comedy. I know you pursued classes that really spoke to you in, in a way um, that it wasn't just about earning a degree here, it was about building an experience of, yeah. of uh, being at WSU. So I really wanna encourage those of you who are students to think about what fuels your passion and what opportunities are available in your college experience here at WSU to pursue those. Yeah. For those of you who are here for common reading credit, I'm going to have um, our tech person. Oh, wait, hold on, before you send the link, yeah. I just wanna say also, so. If anybody, my email address is just my name at Gmail. So if anybody has specific questions I didn't answer, let me know. Uh, but then also I wanted to say, what was I? Oh, I wanted to plug uh, Buddy's book, Labyrinth of Ice just won uh, a big award at the Banff, uh, I think book festival. It won, I think best, best travel writing. Is that right, Buddy? Oh, uh, you're very kind. Uh, the Adventure course? Travel Award. The Adventure Thanks, Travel man. Award. So yeah, so this is Labyrinth on Ice. Get it on audiobook or uh, wherever books are sold. Uh, and yeah, if you have any other questions I didn't answer, uh, my, my email address is just tedtremper at gmail.com uh, and I'm very happy to help with whatever. Well, that's very you generous. Need. Thank you so much, Ted. I truly have very little to do. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so the, the, the link is for an anonymous survey and anyone who oh, has, okay. uh, who has I was hoping they had to wait till you gave it so that way that we'd still have a captive audience but so any of you whether your students or not who'd like to give some feedback about the um the event today we would welcome your feedback if you're a student needing credit at the end of the survey it will take you to a place where you can enter your name and id number and uh wsu email so we can um have have you in the list that verifies attendance. So with that, I wanna thank both Buddy and Ted so much for your time yeah. and our, um, our partners at the Global Campus who have made the tech for this possible tonight. Uh, thank you always for partnering with us. We look forward to seeing many of you at, at future Common Reading events. Thank you so much. Bye, thank you.